Why hello there, welcome back to my channel. It's great to have you here with me once again. If it's your first time checking out the show, you know what to do. Smash that like button, hit subscribe, and of course, leave me a comment down below with all your thoughts, feelings, and suggestions regarding this very, very interesting topic. I knew it, I bloody knew it. I always knew it. Deep down, when I was recording that video the other day, I knew something was wrong. And it wasn't necessarily sold. I really wasn't sold on this idea that somehow, you know, Tony Kinchkiff decided to get on stage and just go into some sort of anti-Asian diatribe in the middle of this stop Asian hate campaign that's going on at the moment. It just didn't make any sense. And especially when you know of Tony's comedy and you know what he does on Kill Tony and you know what they do as a crew overall. It just didn't make sense that the first experience a comedian like that would have with Tony Hinchcliffe would be on stage in Austin, Texas. And the first thing they'd want to do is run to social media to complain. It just didn't add up. Something wasn't adding up too well. Well, guess what's happened now? Now the truth has finally come to light. And now that we know this Pang Dang guy comedian is an absolute piece of SHIT. He went above and beyond to try and cancel a fellow comedian's career for what? A few likes on Instagram, a few follows on Twitter, some retweets here and there, and some sympathy points from people who probably are never going to go watch him do stand up anyway in the first place. Absolutely diabolical. I let myself the last 24 hours have been pretty insane, man. And I always had a feeling that the full story wasn't exactly what we saw via the Pang Dang Twitter video that he put out over the last couple of days. It just seemed a bit iffy. Maybe it's because of my experience of watching so many Street Fight videos and public freakout stuff on Reddit. There's always context removed of some of those videos, especially when they come from people that were anti-mask or whatever it may be. They would purposely start recording at a point where they felt they were right in the argument, but then you never see the beginning part. So sometimes you, you know, you're quick to judge who's the hero and who's the villain in the story. And then the full video comes out and you and then you get an actual understanding as to why that person freaked out you get a real good idea of it but you need to have the full video in the full context of it context of being in a comedy club having a drink it being late at night and having people on stage try things out be a bit risque and just go for it in an effort to make you laugh taking those videos uploading them onto a social media platform and then trying to dissect them with you know your cold sober eyes really does take away the magic from all that comedy and just kind of strips any hilarity any comedy from it at all and of course if you're paying dang and you want to weaponize it in an effort to counter somebody it's the perfect perfect ammunition and so far from what we've seen he was lying he completely orchestrated this entire affair in order to boost his career it seems like in order to kind of gain favor with people who weren't going to give him a job in the first place why would he do something like this what a terrible terrible on goal but the best thing to come out of this has been tony hinchcliffe's comedy friends coming out and supporting him for once we've seen the comedy community come out in droves and support his right to say offensive things on stage even if it was offensive which it clearly wasn't now we've seen the context but they've come out and support him and one of the biggest uh, bits of support that he received over social media has been the following from tim dillon i don't believe tony hinchcliffe hates people but he made the worst decision as a comic or human could make in that particular moment but that guy has given platforms to people with als whose last wish was to do comedy the show he created and did mean something to people I've watched people of all races, genders, and sexual orientations have a great sense on Kill Tony. Some went on to have careers. For some, it was the it was just a moment that they wanted. They drove for hours to do a minute of stand up at the comedy store. You can't dismiss that completely because that does end up happening when somebody does get publicly cancelled for some reason, even if it's warranted. For some reason, all their accomplishments, all the good that they did prior, gets completely eviscerated. No one's allowed to remember them for the good that they did. No one's allowed to come up and support them. You only have to concentrate on the bad, and sometimes a bad incident a bad decision shouldn't define your entire career but the very revealing part of this entire thing has been these clips that have come up on social media showing the comedian peng dang in the company of other people associated with tony hinchcliffe and the kill tony crew specifically jeremiah watkins dating his history and relationship with that entire crew going back as far as 2019 absolutely insane so he's known these people for years he knows exactly what type of comedy they're into he knows exactly what they do on stage he knows exactly how far they're willing to push it and knows exactly the kind of role that he was playing within that crew but you see his comedy in the first place right it's a little bit you know it's a little bit hacky you know he's always kind of leaning into the fact that he's chinese and just 
using that as material more so to get applause as opposed to get you know hilarious outbursts of laugh but this clip here from twitter courtesy of a person called ted trembley shows peng dang in the company of jeremiah watkins and also features a clip of peng dang going on stage at kill tony back in 2019 when he first met the kill tony crew and he gets a taste of what tony hinchcliffe's comedy is like so really and truly should he be surprised by what he heard on that austin stage i don't think so but you can judge for yourself in the following video uh pong and i did um a show at the vulcan gas company earlier this weekend um on thursday with brian redman william montgomery and david lucas and that yes. show was so fun <laughs> thank you thanks for having me man that yeah was it was crazy to follow all those great comics. And uh, I met you guys originally through Kill Tony. Uh, Kill Tony. Yes. Because, um, Pong, I saw you the very first time you went on stage was at, was it the Fort Worth High News or it Dallas? It was the Fort Worth High News. All right, this is it, though. Um, so please remember that the first time he'd ever gone on stage it seems like again we don't know if it's true because you know people in entertainment love to lionize their stories and lie about when they started and maybe add some years take away some years if they think they're good um add some years if they think they're crap whatever it may be but if we're going by his account the first time he went on stage was 2019 at a kill tony show they gave him his opportunity he gave him a chance to make it within comedy and this is how he repays them I'm fucking serious no matter what happens the buck of destiny will decide i'm digging deep you guys sure one more time all right this is it put your hands together for your final comedian of this fort worth kill tony goes by the name of pang dang made in china i like that do you fall apart easily i'm sorry because <laughs> you're made in china i asked if you fall apart easily uh. <laughs> hey so he's pretty he got a you know a strong introduction as to what tony hinchcliffe's about and what their relationship will go on to be <laughs> so fun so you moved here a year ago you're it's unbelievable english uh your 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 delivery is so crisp which clearly comes from chinese delivery mm. <laughs> <laughs> yes how long have. of a set can you do my guess is like 30 minutes or less Another delivery joke. <laughs> you ever walk anybody in the audience? Oh, gosh. You're like if Dane Cook cooked dog. <laughs> Act outs and everything. My goodness. That's incredible. What a fun, fun way to bring this show to a big end. What it gave him his start in comedy. And the way he wanted to repay them was to upload a doctor's clip on Twitter that depicted Tony Hinchcliffe to be the head of some anti-Asian coalition of some sorts in order to propel his career forward. I don't know, man. I don't know. Then, of course, to add entry to insult and to really clear up things and to give us a real understanding as to what exactly happened, the comedian Ari Shafir decided to upload an entire clip, 23 minutes long, showing exactly what led up to the situation that we saw on Peng Deng's Twitter account and it tells a completely different story. I'm sure most of you have seen it. I'm not going to play the entire clip, but you can definitely check it out for yourself. But the most interesting part of it is obviously the description, which I'm going to read for you now. Here's the whole set of two comedians in a row. I, comedian Ari Shafir, am only showing this because one of the comics that had to be set viciously edited and released without his consent. So I'll do it in his, in his voice. Um... This here, this here is what uh, live stand-up is, and this war, and uh, comics riff off. No, I'm going to do that. Let's just do it normally. Comics riff off what precious comics say sometimes. That's just some of the context that you need to understand a joke when you're not in the actual room. In this one, the first comic does a super pandering, initially joke-free bit about wanting people to be nice to Asians. So the next comic, Tony, went on to contrast the joke by going super obviously um, overboard mean to Asians. That contrast is where the humour is and what the crowd was laughing at. Those laughs you hear are the honest reactions of a crowd who saw all the context. It's in Austin, one of the most liberal cities in America, and they're all laughing. Liberal people are laughing, and they're laughing because they understand the comedian doesn't hold those views. The ridiculousness of the overreaction is what's bringing out the laughs. Live comedy is the best. It should never be released without permission from the comedian because sometimes we take chances. We try things that might not work, but we'd like to work out. To go for something to see what works and where the lines are. The only way to figure out 
is by trying stuff in these types of shows if this doesn't go over our punishment is that we have to deal with the bomb and that sucks you know, if the people start filming these and then the result is the comics won't be able to try stuff we won't be able to grow it holds back the entire creative process i'm only showing this because of the previous betrayal and that's exactly what it is it's a betrayal there's actually a bit where when tony inchkiff comes up and he actually goes for it and starts kind of quote unquote attacking peng dang first of all the crowd is laughing but there's also some nervous laughs in there there's also people you know nervously sitting in their seats not sure if they're actually allowed to laugh so you can see actual mixture of it but what you actually hear over most of it is the actual laughs people are laughing hysterically at that joke because of the ridiculousness of it as Ari Shafir pointed out so I'll play a little bit of the clip now as it's leading off from Peng Dang and going into Tony Hinchcliffe so you can get an idea exactly of what happened <laughs> laughing at the joke you might not like it it might not be your type of humor but those people in that room found it hilarious they found the contrast hilarious and for some reason Peng Dang decided to upload the clip onto Twitter and try and bury a colleague not even a colleague somebody that you would might have called a peer maybe someone you might even relate to as a mentor considering his inexperience in stand-up I just don't understand it I really don't I don't get this compulsion that people have where they want to be a victim especially when it comes to the arts it's hard enough to make it regardless of your gender regardless of your race in something that there is no linear kind of path to the top you don't just do a certain amount of years on the road or a certain amount of years at open mic and then you suddenly get a tv deal and you suddenly have a comedy special on netflix it doesn't work like that it's intangible there are no quick fixes there is no shortcut to getting good you have to consistently put yourself up for ridicule on stage risk the humiliation of having jokes bomb inviting friends to come and see you and see you completely shit the bed it's probably not the best thing for your overall mental um it's obviously not the best thing for your psyche i think long term which is why most comedians are a little bit you know off center so you finally get there you get some wind in your sails you finally pick up a bit of momentum a bit of head of steam and you probably still feel like you're not where you need to be and the way you want to cheat and get to the top is to bury one of your colleagues one of your friends this is not even an enemy it's somebody that's actually given you a chance given you a platform to showcase your skills and this is what you do this is how you thank them i don't know obviously the mature and maybe the grown-up and considered response to this will be just to forgive and accept it and move on because you know this person's career is basically tanked now they're gonna have to you know probably move to a whole another city or maybe move to a whole different scene and maybe start doing improv or whatever it may be but you no know, no no comedian worth their weight is gonna be one is gonna want to be associated with Peng dang they won't want to be maybe on the same lineup as him he's gonna be completely ostracized sides from that community and if you hear about these comedians on podcasts i think that they bang on about all the time is the hang the hang the hang seems to be one of the most you know integral parts of being a stand-up the ability to go to any part of the world and have a connection with somebody because of this art form that you all kind of could devote your entire life to and he's gonna not have that anymore why would you do that everyone that are basically congratulating him or saying in his comments i'm sorry that happened to you they're not gonna be there for him now they're not gonna go to any of these new shows 
they're not going to buy any of his merch. They're not going to watch his comedy specials on, on whatever platform it might be on. They're just happy to hitch a ride onto the cancellation train in order to take somebody else down. And I don't like it. I never did. And I said from the beginning, the other video, I was skeptical from the start. It just didn't make any sense. Why was all the context removed from it? Why was it perfectly shot? Why was it from a particular angle? And why did he offer no more comment after the fact? He went on TMZ, got his five minutes of fame, and now what? I don't really understand what's going on. I don't really get it. Because even if that wasn't the case and this video didn't come out, I still wouldn't think he was a racist. He might have said a dumb thing in a moment to get funny, to get some laughs out of a crowd, but you wouldn't necessarily call him an R word. That's ridiculous. That's way over the top. But here we are. But maybe I'm reading too much into it. And this is just what ends up happening to most people that suck at what they do inevitably they reach a point where their skills can only get them so far so they have to you know wave the victim flag above their head in order to get some more attention and to propel their career even further and if that means stepping on their friends heads and if that means betraying their friends stabbing in the back then they'll do whatever it may be done in order to do that but anyway that's the video peace